We're in a, mar- a series on Mark. Mark 11 is where we are today. We took the week off last week to go th- have a, a fun Freedom Day. How many of you guys loved Freedom last week? Come on, somebody. <laughs> Harley's in church. And uh, it was a good time. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I hope you had a great time. And uh, we're in Mark 11. And we're not going verse by verse. It would be fun. There's so much. I mean, there's just unbelievable the amount of stuff in, these, in uh, this gospel. But we just don't have enough time. We'd, have, we'd be here all day we, just to cover one chapter. And so we're kind of jumping around as we've been going through this gospel of Mark. And I want to pick up in Mark 11, verse 15. Jump down to verse 15 with me. Read the rest of the chapter this week. Later today, maybe pick up, make sure you're following along with us, but we're going to start in verse 15. It says, it says 15 through 17, and they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, he being Jesus. Jesus enters the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the, and, and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. He would not allow them to carry anything through it. This is It's wild to me. This temple, it's a big temple, and he was in the outer courts of it, which was the only part open to Gentiles. And uh, he walks in, he starts flipping tables. Think about it. uh, A a historian said that during a week of Passover where all people would kind of come to the temple to make sacrifice on a yearly basis, there'd be over 200,000 sheep sold and sacrificed in the temple. We're not talking about five or six or 10 or 50 sheep. We're talking, this is, this is packed out. There is, think about the New York Times, the, the stock exchange, but add livestock. And Jesus comes walking in here and he's like, hold up. People walking through, people carrying vessels, carrying merchandise, carrying business stuff pulling uh, carts, having families. There's just chaos in here, but this does not look like a house of prayer. That's what this is. It's a house of prayer, but y'all have made it a den of robbers. Selling, exchanging, sheep, livestock, pigeons, just flips it up. They didn't have the, as good of a security team as we have. Our security team's a little better, apparently, than the, uh, the temple security team. We ain't having anyone in here walking up in here flipping ropes. But I wanted to, say, to, to lean in onto a little, little passage in there that I think gets overlooked. It says that he would not allow anyone to walk through the temple. In other translations, it says to carry vessels or wares or uh, merchandise, if you will. Why? Because at that time, the temple was central and so big that they could save significant amount of time on their daily journey if they didn't walk around the temple, but walked through the temple. And he was like, nah, if you ain't coming to pray, you ain't coming through here. Which makes me, makes me think of a question for us. Is God our destination or are we simply using this as a pass-through? Do we see God as a shortcut or the destination itself? When, this is what it sounds like. If you're, if you're using God as a shortcut, not as the destination, then your prayers sound more like, God, I need healing, not, hey, God, I'm here. You see, if God is the shortcut, then you're using him to get somewhere else. But if God is the destination, then when you get there, that's all you wanted. And many of us are using God as a shortcut on our journey. And we've missed the fact that he's supposed to be the destination. How many of us are using 
God is a shortcut. Just passing through, just heading through, just saving time, just getting somewhere else, just on our way to a business, on our way to a trip, on our way to other things. But God is just, let me just get on through here. And we've lost the point of it being a house of prayer and we've just made it a shortcut. It's a shortcut to feeling better. It's a shortcut to, to kind of checking the box that I'm a moral person, I'm a spiritual person. I'm, I think I'm raising my kids right. It's what I'm supposed to do. So I checked that box. I feel good about myself. But I never actually got there and spent time with God. I just went through there to feel good about my journey. Is God the point or just part of it? In 1 Corinthians, it says, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, it says that now you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, it moves from this established big temple. It goes, now you are the temple. Yeah, God, in ha- God, God dwells in you. How many things are passing through you on a daily basis? How many thoughts habits, desires, how many cultural things are using you as a shortcut to their purpose? If you are the temple, is there a standard in your life or are all the doors open and people can just come and go as they please? Because I think in our culture, uh, what's happening in our world is We're allowing so much cultural things to come and go as they please through our life. So we we pick up cultural habits and we pick up cultural ways of thinking and we pick up their desires. We pick up, oh, I have this desire, I got that desire. I have this craving, I have this lust. And maybe you didn't act on it, maybe you didn't do it, but it passed through your temple. You thought about it, you looked at it, it. You're allowing the desires around to have access in and out of your temple anytime they want. What are the habits that just float around in your life? What is the words, what's the thinking, what's the thoughts, what's the desires that have free access in and out of your soul? You know, the Bible says to take every thought into captivity of the knowledge of Christ. I think what that means is thoughts don't just get to come and go in my life as they please. I grab a thought if it's not of Christ, I go, no, 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 that doesn't belong in my life. That's not passing through my temple. I'm not evaluating that gossip because it doesn't belong in here. That's, that doesn't get to come through my temple. Your gossip, doors closed, like you don't get to pass through. That idea, that desire, that way of doing things, that way of speaking to your wife, that way of leaving, no, nope, that doesn't belong in my temple, has no access walking through here. But too many of us give access to too many things and it's passing through our temple and we're looking more like the world than Christian, which is a baby Jesus, a little Jesus, a miniature Jesus. Like you're supposed to look different than the culture around. But if we're allowing culture to have free access into our temple, why would we look any different if we desired the same things? Too many of us are giving access in our temple to too many things. The other thing I think is a struggle is in this in this idea that some stuff is just coming and going through, the, through our temple. Too many of us don't have clarity for our journey, don't have clarity for our destination. And since we don't know where we're going, too many of us are just copying other people's journeys. Oh, that's what, that's what you, that's, that's popular today? Yeah, I want that too. Yeah, I want, I want that too. I want that raise. I want that money. I want that. I want that. I want followers. Why do you want followers? I just want more likes. Why? Because, dude. Because. Because I need them. We just start copying the things of the world and get ingrained in their habits, ingrained in the way they live, and we look nothing different. And if you don't know where you're going, you don't know when to camp. 
You don't know when to stop. You don't know when to keep going. And if you don't have clarity for your direction, clarity for, with your vision, clarity on the journey that God has for you, then someone else will always pass through and get you distracted. And you'll end up following your boss's vision. You'll follow a, a family member's vision. You'll follow political vision. You'll follow political party's vision. Why? Because someone in that group has got vision and if you don't have it, they'll fill it with theirs. And so too many of us are living lives for someone else's vision, someone else's destiny, someone else's journey. Because we just allow too much pass through in our temple that we don't even know our calling anymore. You know, the, the sad thing is that the devil doesn't have to even get you to sin. As long as he keeps you distracted, you're never doing anything for, for God anyway. How many Christians has the devil been like, I don't even need you to sin. You're so distracted living like the world. You ain't building the church, so who cares? I don't need to spend any time on this one because they're so distracted. They're, so, they're just thinking the way the world thinks, acting the way the world acts. Just Their temple is such a pass-through. There's nothing about kingdom building in their life, so they're good. Let them be. Don't wake up a sleeping giant. Just let them be. Just let them act like the world, look like the world, follow the world, have the habits of the world with a little life insurance. As long as they don't get anyone else with life insurance, we're good. As long as they stay quiet about eternity and don't convert anyone, as long as they keep habits that look like the culture around them, let's leave them be. But some of us need to realize that we gotta close some of the doors in our temple and stop letting so many things come through our temple. That no longer can we live lives that everything gets a pass through. Their desires get to pass through. Their gossip gets to pass through. Their fears get to pass through. Their ideals get to pass through. God has already set out exactly the borders of your temple. You don't need news. What's going on? I don't know. I don't need, I don't need to learn how to act from anyone else. It's right here for me. We are so close-minded. No, I'm very open to this. I'm as, I'm as open as it gets to this. But so many of us have open temples and the relationship comes and goes and the addiction comes and goes. It's too much. I mean this, and I don't want this to sound churchy or preachy or this is a great church line, I want you to, I want this to really, like I want you to think about this this week. If Jesus showed up in your house or showed up in your car to tomorrow on the way to work, like in the flesh, it's like, wow, Jesus is here. And he looked at you and evaluated your life, your temple, the temple that he inhouses, the temple that he lives in, the temple that, the, the new temple, your life, your body, would he look at you and say, man, that's a temple of prayer? Or would it just have so many pass-throughs it would look like every other cultural person? Well, it's just, that's just for preachers. Preachers are supposed to pray more than, no, you're a temple and you were created to pray. You were created to have God as the points of your journey. How many of us have, have gone, oh, that's just so spiritual? That's not really, that's not real. Like, am I supposed to really live that way? Yeah, I think that the highest compliment of Jesus would be, man, you are a person of prayer. You're in my presence all the time. You just worship, you pray, you're connected to me, you, you talk with me. Like, you were created to be a temple of prayer. Oh, no, I just pray when I have an, an issue. Oh, so it's a shortcut. I just pray when I'm sick, so it's a shortcut. I pray when I need something, so it's a shortcut. I pray at dinner, so that doesn't matter. If, if food showing up is the only trigger for your prayer life, that's a weak prayer life. Or you have bad food that needs prayer. You were created to be a temple of prayer. In Mark 11, verse 20, keep going with me in this, in this chapter. Mark 11, 20 through 22. 
It says, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. Now, earlier in this chapter, they're walking by and Jesus sees a fig tree and has 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 uh, leaves and flowers and he walks up expecting figs because he's hungry and there's nothing to eat. And he curses it. Next day, they're walking by. Peter's like, hold up, Jesus, the tree that you cursed, it's withering up. And another translation says it's withering from the roots. A couple of things I want to point out real quick. One, do y'all know Christians that they, they have a lot of leaves and flowers? There's a lot of, a lot of noise. There's a lot of action, but there's, there's not much fruit. We need to make sure that we're people that don't value busyness, but fruitfulness. I'm going to say that again for someone. Yeah, you should value fruitfulness over busyness. Oh, I'm just so busy. Bless your heart. That means you don't know how to organize your life. That's not a compliment. That doesn't mean you're important. That doesn't mean you're powerful. That mean, that's not a, like you shouldn't say, I'm so busy. But I, who cares? Are you fruitful? You have 24 hours in a day. Everyone else has the same amount of time. How are you using the time that God's given you? Are you bearing fruit or just busy? When Jesus shows up to your life, is there a lot of leaves but no fruit? But the second thing is, is Jesus knew the power of his words. He cursed the tree and then it dried up from the roots. I think a lot of us don't know the power of our words and we're really frustrated at our lives because they're not producing the fruit we want, but we keep cursing them so they're withering from the roots, not producing any fruit, and we keep getting more and more upset that our life is fruitless and our words keep cursing the very things we're trying to grow. Yeah. You see, you really want a great marriage, but you keep speaking negativity into it. Your words keep cursing the very roots that are trying to grow fruit. You want to raise great kids, but you keep speaking down to them. Those are words of cursing. They're, gonna, they're, they're, they're crippling the tree from producing fruit because of the words that you're speaking. Men, husbands and fathers, I need, y'all need to hear and understand and realize just how meaningful your words are. Culture saying, oh, just the men hold your feelings in. No, that's not godly. That's not helpful. Get your blessing out of your mouth more. And every day you should be speaking blessing over your wife, blessing over your children, blessing over your church, blessing over your business, blessing over your thinking, blessing over your, speak blessing. Oh, I never have enough. I'm always upset. I'm always sick. I always get, stop speaking curses. Well, I'm just being honest. Great. Well, honestly, live a bad life. Honestly, keep enjoying the fruit. He didn't say, oh, I was, just, I was just being honest. No, speak life or death. It's in the power of your tongue. And so many of us are so frustrated at the lack of fruit in our life, and it keeps producing more cursing that comes out of our mouth, and it keeps producing more bad fruit. What is it that you're speaking? Are you speaking into your marriage? Are you speaking blessing over your children? Every night when you put them to bed, you speak blessing over them. No matter how you feel, no matter how they acted, if they were three and acted like three, they should be crazy. <laughs> They're children. The Bible literally says foolishness is in them. Doesn't mean you should speak foolishness over them. You should speak blessing over them. Speak the promises of God over them. You should speak blessing over your businesses. Speak blessing over your coworkers. Speak blessing over people. You should be planting seeds of blessing because that's what you want to grow. That's the harvest you want. That's the fruit you want. But too many of us are living lives so frustrated at having no fruit and we keep speaking curses. We're always sick. We're always upset. We're always angry. We're all... It's this cycle that you keep creating Self-fulfilling prophecies. Jesus knew the power of his words. But then he goes on. I love this next part. He goes, believe, have faith in God. Verse 22, have faith in 
God, it, he, it's not, it doesn't get much more clear than that. Have faith. It's my belief. Have, believe God. Believe in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you will receive it and you will have it. Believe and you will have it. Have faith in God. He says, when you have faith, you will say to this mountain, be moved. Now, Jesus is saying, listen, your part in the equation is to have faith or to believe. God's part in the equation is to then move the mountain. You believe, God moves the mountain. You believe, God opens the door. You believe, God brings healing. You believe, God brings provisions. See, your part in the equation is to simply have faith in God. But too many of us are waiting to have the ability to do what we're believing for, and we skip the part that we're supposed to do. We're trying to wait until we have the ability or what we say is big enough faith to move mountains. You don't need big enough faith to move mountains. You need big enough faith to believe in God. There's a big difference. If you have the faith it takes to believe in God, God has the strength to move the mountain. Here, I got my little girl with me. Come up here, Willow. Put your hands together for my beautiful oldest. Okay. So if she jumps to me, what she needs is faith in her dad's ability to catch her. So if she has faith in me, or if she believes in me enough, she'll jump. But it doesn't mean that she needs to have the ability to catch herself. You see, she doesn't need my strength. She simply needs, she, she needs belief in my strength. If she thinks I can do it, then she'll believe in me. Okay, she didn't catch herself, right? She didn't make herself any lighter. She wasn't like trying to help. Like it was like, okay, if I could get, I, I gotta lose some weight before I jump. I gotta get smaller before I jump. Maybe I should take my shoes off just to help him catch me. Maybe I could, I'll help the process. I'll, I'll take a step down. I'll, no, 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 she wasn't looking to help me. She thought I could catch her, so she had faith in my strength. She didn't do any work. She just jumped. You guys getting this? Love you. So she had faith in me. Her faith got her to jump to me. But her faith didn't catch her. I caught her. God says, have faith in God. Jesus is God. Have faith in God. God can move mountains. So why do you not have more faith? Why don't you, why don't you jump more? Why don't you start trusting God more? Because God's not asking you to do it. He's asking you to believe. So it, uh, God, I need you to heal me. God, I need you to open a door of, in, in my work. See, I'm not trying to open the door. I'm trying to just have enough faith to. Too many people are thinking, I gotta have bigger faith. Bigger faith for what? Can God heal you? Yes. Good, you're there. Can God open that door? Yes. Can God make a way where there's no way? Can God overcome whatever the struggles are ahead of you? Can God overcome the addiction that you're fighting? So why are you waiting for you to have the ability to overcome what God said he would do? (laughs) 
See, y'all are still golf clapping me because you still want more of the equation. Like, y'all still want more than this. And God's like, no, 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 no. You jump to me. I'll do the rest. But will you jump? See, this is where the rubber meets the road of was God actually the point? Was he actually your destination? Or is he simply a pass-through? Because if he's a pass-through, I'm just trying to get there, God. Can you help me or not? If you can't, I'll find someone else or something else that gets me there. God, I want you to fulfill all my desires, but if you don't, I'm going to date her again. Because at least she makes me feel good on Fridays. God, if I want you to meet all my desires, but, but I, I'm not going to give up this addiction. God, I, I, you're my focus, but I need to make my money or else I'll feel like a failure. I won't say it out loud, but I'll be angry at, at home. I won't like my wife. I'll just be frustrated because I don't feel like I'm enough, so I need to make more. I'm, I'm, I'm a failure. I'm, I'm not a success. I'm not strong enough. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not big enough. I need more followers. I need more likes or my insecurities are going to take over. But God was never the point. Fame was the point. Success was the point. Money was the point. Your lusts were the point. Or is it, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to believe that you can make a way. I'm going to believe that you can overcome. I'm going to believe that you can heal me. I'm going to, even in the doctor's report, even in the cancer report, even in the depression, even through the medic, even through what I'm struggling with, even through a pandemic, even through, even through economy issues, no matter what I'm going through, I'll jump. I'll jump. Because I believe you. I believe that you could catch me. I believe in your strength. I believe in your abilities. I believe that you're faithful. I, I believe that you'll never leave me or forsake me. I believe that you're with me. I believe that you're for me. I believe you got a calling and a purpose and a destiny for my life. I believe, and because I believe that you have a plan for me, I'll jump. And it doesn't get any harder or easier. It's not like other people, like, oh, they just have big faith. It's easy for them. Like, no, when my parents were 22 and 24 and started the church, which is absurd, by the way, in case you're wondering, that don't, don't do that. But they did. And they just go for it. They just start a church. And they were like, God said, uh, they just felt like God put it on the inside of the heart to set out Christian Faith Center, to reach people, to serve people, to know the rest. So they're just like, let's go, God. Let's go. They just jumped. Did they have any certainty? No. Did they have any financial backing? No. Did they have anything to fall back on? No. They just said, we felt like God said to start a church show. We jumped. And they're for 40 years. It's not easier. It's not like today they're like, oh, now it's so easy to trust God. No. They still have got to jump. He goes through 11 months of chemo a decade ago. That wasn't easy. She goes through cancer, uh, surgery. They're like, you have cancer, go through. That was just, God, we're trusting. Battle after battle after battle after battle. It's not like all of a sudden it just gets, no. They still keep trusting God. And they're willing to jump over and over and over. Are you willing to jump? Does God put something on the inside of you and you're like, I'm fighting for my family. I'm fighting for my kids. I'm fighting for my marriage. I'm fighting for the lost in the Northwest. I'm fighting to build his church. I'm fighting for, I'm fighting to take a step. I'm fighting for, will you jump? Or are you just going to wait your whole life and talk about what you feel God had on the inside? I felt like I should have started a life. Guys, you know, it was real. You know, I almost went into ministry years up. Cool, bro. Thanks for the great story. How about you? You didn't do. Thanks for bragging about the lack of faith. We're looking for someone that's got enough faith to jump. The bank had come onto the stage. I don't know any better way to say it. 
I wish I had a better preacher, preacher line. You know I'm talking about those good preacher lines that people have on Twitter. I don't have a ton of those, but. Have you ever had original faith? Not copycat faith. You know what I'm talking about? Like a cop, like you would just copy other people. Like all they, like that, they took that vacation, I want that vacation. Oh, he got a raise, I want that raise. Oh, I want their marriage, or I want those kids, or I want that car, or I want those clothes. Like, so often our desires are based off of someone else already having something and us just wanting that. And so often we take that same toxic desires into our spiritual life, and so our spiritual faith only wants what others have as well. And I want their testimony, and I want their experience, and I want to overcome battles the way it looks for them. It meant it looks so much easier for them to serve God. It looks so much easier for them. And, that per- and we have copycat faith. And so we pray prayers, and we think, they're, we think, oh, look at how spiritual I am. But in all honesty, you're just praying what you've heard someone else pray. When was the last time, let me say it this way, have you ever in faith, ask God for something that not a single other person on the planet has ever asked for. Has there ever been a prayer of faith come out of your soul that was the first time God ever heard that prayer? Such authentic, original faith that you said, God, you created me uniquely. You formed me in my mother's womb. There has never been a person before me or after me that's like me. you got a perfect plan and a destiny for me. This is why I exist. This is what I'm asking for in faith because you created me with the mission, with the calling, with the destiny. And that's all and only what I'm asking for. I'm not asking for their calling. I'm not asking for their testimony. I'm not asking for their marriage. I'm not asking for their finances. Finances, I'm asking you for what you created me to ask for. Yes. Have you ever had an authentic, original prayer, a faith request that was so original that it's the first time God ever heard it asked? Yes. When I pray for my kids, No one's prayed for their kids the way I pray for mine. Because no one's had Willow. No one's ever had Nora. No one ever's had Leave. I never will have her. I'm the one dad that gets to pray for them. So my prayers of faith for them are my prayers. And I'm asking things that no one else will be asked for. And when I look at the city, and I look at the communities, I look at the addresses that all of you drive. I have maps on my office where you guys drive from, where all of our givers and our dream team and our families. And I know where you live and I'm praying for your cities and I'm going, God, put, us, put campuses in these cities. Stretch us, God. Enlarge us. Let us reach more people because there's more people that still haven't been reached or still going to hell. That is my prayer. There ain't no one else praying these prayers that I'm praying because that's my calling. I'm asking for things no one's ever asked for in Washington. Are you asking for things that he only created you to ask for? Has there been a prayer of faith that's grown out of your heart that God said, oh, someone woke up. Someone woke up. Someone's alive. Someone's ready to live the life I created for them to live. Someone finally tapped into their potential, to their calling, to their destiny. That's why I formed them in their mother's womb. That's why I've protected them all these years. That's why I've been faithful all these years. That's why I've guarded them all these years. This is the plan. They finally found it. They finally found that they found me. No longer is there a pass-through. No longer is there shortcuts or sidetracks. No, they found my presence and they said, I exist for this God and I'm here to ask for these people. I'm here to ask for this calling. I'm here to ask for this family. I'm here to ask for this blessing on my life. I don't want their blessing. I don't want their marriage. I don't want their stuff. I don't want any of that. I just want what you've called me to have, for me to do, for me to carry, for me to build. I don't need their tools. 
I don't need their equipment because I don't need that in my calling. I need what you called me to. I need my tools. I need my equipment. I need my support. I need the people in my life that you've called me to. I don't need that person because I ain't called in my life. It's time that we wake up and stop praying copycat prayers. I'm so, I'm so grateful that you're blessed, but I don't want your blessing. I'm so grateful that you had a great marriage. I don't want your marriage. I'm so grateful you got great kids. I don't want your kids. I'm so grateful you got a great testimony. I don't want your testimony. I want mine. I want my calling. I want my family. I want to pray prayers that are big for me. I don't want to compete with my prayer and your prayer. I want you to pray authentic prayers and I'll pray authentic prayers and call it a day. We don't got to have pray-offs. Whose faith is bigger? Just have faith for your road. I'll have faith for my road. You have faith for your family, men. I'll have faith for mine. You have faith for your children. I'll have faith for my children. Pray some authentic prayers. Pray a prayer that God's never heard before because he never created someone like you before. You're original and authentic. You were created to stand out. You were created to pray break. You were created to believe big. You were created to move mountains, but only the mountains God has called you to move. Pray with faith. Believe something big.